Poppycock Podcast with Victor Pacheco. Hello. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Poppycock Podcast with your host, Victor Pacheco. We got a very special sh- episode today with a very legendary guest, the one and only Mr. Tommy Chong. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the clap. Appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry. I'm really out of breath right now. I'm really excited. Uh, I smoke weed. I'm a pothead. Um, uh, this is it's, it's an honor to have you on on, on my podcast. It's, it, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, how are you doing today? Good. Where are you uh, recording from? I am recording from my <laughs> my one bedroom apartment in uh, Santa Monica. In Santa Monica. Oh, so you're local. Yeah, I'm local. Yeah, yeah I've been doing uh, overseas. I've been all over the world. It's kind of cool, you know. They say, uh, "Ask where are you where are you from." Oh, we're in Ireland, or we're in Scotland, and now we're in Santa Monica. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Santa Monica. What's messed up is I, I moved from Oakland, and it was ranked number recently number one most violent city, Oakland. Number nine, Santa Monica. And I'm like, great. I moved from hood to hood. It's just like it just the the. the <laughs> the crime rate keeps following me no matter what's going on, but you know. <laughs> it's, it's your uh, level of income. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in a nice part. There's a, there's a pool in my, in my apartment complex. That's what I mean. See, the <laughs> the income, the better the place. Yeah, there's still a, uh, unfortunately, there's a homeless encampment two blocks away and I'm just. Well, that's okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. You know, they, they don't. Get the homeless as rent-free apartment. Rent free apartments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Free, free rent, you know. Absolutely. And like um, it's you know, there's uh it's easier to get you know, years ago, uh the homeless were called hobos. Yeah, no, I mean some people still call them hobos. Hobos. Well, the hobos, the Cree, they they had a whole uh organization and they had their their uh do's and don'ts. And one of the do's was that there were people that owned homes and resident, you know, but they loved to binge. And so they would go and hang out with the homeless or the hobos. And uh, so they wouldn't, you know, go get drunk for a few days and uh, go on a binge. And then, you know, do the hobo life, including cooking out or whatever you had to do. And then they would uh, go back to their lives. And I, and I'm, guessing the same is going on here with the homeless because oh, you know think about it to live on the street you have to have your shit together you know what i'm saying absolutely you gotta be tough you, you got everything you own in, in that little shelter whatever it is and you're out on the street you got no protection so to speak and uh and you're you're and if there's predators out there which there are <laughs> think about it on the street, especially. Uh, so the ones that, you know, I look at them in, uh, with a whole different uh, t- bit of respect because the ones, you know, that you see that are visible, you know, they're, they got their shit together one way or another. You know, either there's too crazy for anybody to deal with or, or they're smart enough to know how to deal with everything. So that's my take on the homeless. <laughs> No, for reals. I mean, like, I just, I, I, I try, I go out of my way to humanize homeless people by acknowledging them and letting them know I'm broke as fuck. And you know, you're broke as fuck when homeless people are telling you, oh, I'm sorry, I'll pray for you. So I'm like, I'm crying in my car and I'm like, I'm a piece of shit. I don't deserve love. And this homeless person's telling me they're going to pray for me because I'm so broke. Like, holy shit. Like I'm doing like a, a bar show for tip money. Not even it's ga- not even, you know, it's like two gallons of gas. Well, it depends where you live, but uh, <laughs> right now, <laughs> you, you know, that's all, that's all good. Um, like warming up. You know, you know, when you go to a gym, you got you just don't jump into it, you know, unless you're crazy. But you got to warm up, you know, and and that's 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 what we're doing half our life. <laughs> I'm 
Mr. Tommy Chong, you're talking to the wrong guy about a gym. Like I, <laughs> I've been trying, I actually did lose a weight since the pandemic because I got up to 400 and six pounds. Oh, you did. Oh. And now I'm 335 now. So I'm still, oh. still heart attack territory, but I'm doing a lot better now. Well, you know, uh, you, you know, at least you're happy. That's amazing. You know? Yeah, I, definitely. I mean, we're, we're all going through our, 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 the course that we wrote ourselves, you know, when we, when we, before we come into a new life, we, we sort of plan it out, plan it out and decide what we need in order to evolve. And, and this is what you got this time around and it looks like it's doing good. Yeah, so <laughs> podcast. That's one good thing. Dude, and I got one of my comedy heroes. I mean, I'm talking to her right now. It's so funny because all due respect, I, I work with a lot of celebrity comedians. My mom has no idea who they are. I told my mom I was interviewing you, and she said, El Marihuano? And I'm just like, Mom, come on. Like, you know, like that. Like, you judge me. Okay, so yeah, that was actually like one of my questions. Uh, why do you think that? marijuana specifically like marijuana users to a lot of people like we get treated like we're heroin addicts like like we, we're do like meth addicts like i've had that experience where I, i'm like stigmatized because i have chronic pain i'm smoking a, a joint and then it's like oh look at him he's a, oh and i've actually had people tell me like excuse me that's a very offensive smell so i'm like you know you've been a stoner longer than me so <laughs> So like, you know, like you've been a stoner in different decades, you know, I've only been a stoner since the nineties. And so I was born in the eighties. So at any rate, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was smoking weed at 11 years old, but uh, I was wondering uh, when, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, why, why do we get such a bad rap as pot smokers? Well, because it's a racist law. You always got to remember, you know, there was cannabis. See, before they called it marijuana, it was known as cannabis. And better yet, it was known as hemp. And during the war, you know, the government mandated that farmers grow hemp because they needed hemp. They needed the ropes for the ships. They needed the canvas for, for, for the uniforms. They needed, they needed hemp. And so, but when uh, they decided that, uh, especially Hearst, you know, the publisher, when they decided in order to sell a lot of newspapers or to sell any a movie, newspapers, anything, you need conflict, 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 conflict. And so as a result, the Hearst people, the newspaper, they went looking for the obvious enemy. And in every society, the obvious enemy are usually the ethnically uh, diverse but poor, the ones that have peasants in their lineage, you know, and so they get demonized <clears throat> because, they, in other words, they get shit on because they're poor, and 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 if they're poor and brown, well then, whoa, you know, they get another category. But look, but look, look what happened during the Second World War when Hitler decided. See, Hitler was trying to get an uprising going in a very white uh, country. And so the only uh, enemy they could find were the Jews because of their belief. See, and, and the weirdest thing, the, the, what they did for the conflict, they had to pick the weak so they could bully and do what they did. And, and, it, and what happens in society today, especially, uh, in all the countries in the world, there's a rich poor thing going, you see. And that's why the communists, they're, they're very dishonest about it because what they say is that we're going to split everything, but they don't. <laughs> Again, they got their hierarchy and then they got their, the, the ones that need a key, you know. And, and, and that's the way it is with, with, with the human experience. We live in a very um, physical world. And in, in the physical world, you can't have one without the other. You need both. You need up. If you don't have up, you don't have down. 
If you don't have right, you don't have left. If you don't have evil, you don't have good, you see? And so all the opposites, and that's the, the physical world where we live in, you see? And don't forget, the physical world uh, the, is always moving. It's always changing. Like the I Ching says in, in, in you know, the, the I Ching, this great Chinese philosopher's uh, book, uh, that I studied quite a, quite a bit. They say that uh, um, the physical world. Uh, what, I, I lost my train of thought. They, it, it, the violence that we that we see every day is a necessary part of our existence. See, the very earth was born out of violence, you know, and so violence, which is change, change where you go from peace to chaos, where you where where things get mixed up, you know, like a storm is a good example, a hurricane, you know, the physical things that just take everything and shake it up and then and then move on. And, and as a physical world, this is where we live in, okay? So you got opposites, you know, and, and, and that's what we have. And that's what we, we've always had. Like you've you got Spanish in your blood, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, well, you go back in your history and there were times when you guys weren't just the oppressed, you were the oppressors. Yes. <laughs> there was a time you weren't just uh, the, the peasant, you were the kings. The conquistadors. Were, yes. yes. Or, non, or non Cortez. There, there, yeah. There, there was a time when, 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 like, especially with the Spanish Inquisition, where that if you did not believe in, in, in our Lord Jesus Christ, then you got tortured, you got murdered, you got boiled, you got uh, the worst possible thing could happen to you. It's a, it's a physical world. That we we live in, and and that's why uh, when when you ask about marijuana and cannabis, when it was used when it's used as a medicine, it's called cannabis, you know, and when it's used for industrial purposes, it's called hemp, and when they want to use it for racial injustice, they call it marijuana. It's oh. all words. Yeah. And oh, my goodness, that is really like multi. Oh, that is so deep. That was such that was poetic. That was that was poetry. Right. Oh, my God. It's so beautiful. Um, And because beautifully worded, because like it, it's really hard to explain sometimes, especially in America, to white people, because I met white people here in this country that have told me that there's no such thing as racism. Yeah. And I'm just like, OK, OK, okay dude. Yes. See, in, their mind, in their mind, there isn't, you see. I, I grew up in the, one of the most racist cities in the world, in Canada, called Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Now, it wasn't violent racism, you know, but it was implied and it was a belief system. You know, it was like growing up in a city of Trumpies. You know, where, where everybody believed in what Trump believed, you know, and, and what it was, they would put up with black people as long as they were carrying a football or a baseball and, and they were, you know, <laughs> oh, winning, Jesus. The team, you know, <laughs> then they would put up with the black people. In Calgary, there was one Mexican restaurant owned by uh, a Mexican uh, place kit. Of course, he was a, a, a place kick <laughs> for, for the football. He, was, he, he knew how to kick a ball. <laughs> and, and he had a Mexican restaurant. And, and other than that, there were no Mexicans that we, that we knew of. There were plenty of natives, uh, the, you know, the Sioux, uh, the Sarsi, the, the uh, Blackfoot, all the, all the tribes of, that were kicked out of America ended up outside of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And that's where I grew up. And you talk about racism because they had the Indian reservations. And back in the day, the reservations, man, they were like 
prisons. You know, they weren't uh, there for people to re relax and live. They were there to people for people to be be corralled and guarded and, and and you know kept under control. Prison camps. That's what they were. In, in fact, the Pope was just there uh, apologizing for for their the Catholic Church taking the kids out of uh, out of the tribes and forcing them to. Uh, denounce their Indian uh, heritage or their native heritage. I won't even call it Indian, it's, it's a native heritage and, and making them, uh, you know, so they couldn't learn their language or customs or anything. They did that. And then a lot of them just got murdered, got killed for, for you know, racist reasons. And, and so the Pope was just there. And by the way, I got to think, <laughs> I don't know if you're Catholic or not, but uh, I, I, uh, I had such an epiphany a couple of years ago, and, and it just cracked me up. And, and what it was is that when you think of what Catholicism is, okay, it it's a by, byproduct of the Romans when they were in charge. Their God got got murdered by by the first of all the jewish god and and then here comes jesus the prophet and so the the, the romans said you know baal was not making it baal was not making the cut no one even give a shit about baal anymore because but they were talking about jesus and so what the romans did they said okay we will elevate jesus to God status, you know, and they did the one thing that Moses told them not to do, which is make a graven image of God. Yeah, and that's exactly what the Romans <laughs> did. The Christians did. See, early Christianity, they never had the cross as their symbol. See, the, the cross only came later. Uh, the, the first symbol of Christianity was fish, was the fishes, Pisces. And, and so they, that was the first because of, of Jesus' uh, ability to uh, create, you know, the, the multitude, feed the multitudes with the fish, you know. And, uh, and, and so it wasn't until they wanted to turn the Christians into militants that, that they came up with. First of all, the graven image of Jesus being executed on a cross. See, that became the holiest symbol of all the Catholics. And they got, they got, now there, there's so many things wrong with that picture. It, Jesus is not God, obviously, because if he was a God, he wouldn't be on that cross. He wouldn't even be in human form. <laughs> You know, God is spiritual. It tells you everywhere in the teaching, including Jesus' teaching. And now Jesus taught everything. And the, and the, the Roman Catholics went against, their, went against their own, their prophet's teaching. He's a prophet. Yeah. And, and, and when, when you become a Christian, you have to swear that he is the son of God. He was born uh, immaculate conception with Mary and all that story, you know, <laughs> that whole story. But the, in, in, in reality, the real Christianity never believed that. The real Christianity believed that God is spirit. And when you pray to spirit, when you pray to God, you pray to God in spirit. And, and God made everything that was made. And what God never made was not made. And so everything uh, that we know in the physical world, there has to be opposites. You can't have good without bad. You can't have uh, right without left. You can't have up without down. And, and think about it. In the physical world, there's everything. In, in the opposite of everything is nothing. The spiritual world, there is nothing in it but love and energy. And that's what we are. And so as, uh, as we 
evolve because we're all evolving and we will all evolve because we're eternal beings. See, we've always been here. You've always been here. I've always been here. And see, this life, you became a comedian. I became a comedian, you know, <clears throat> and here we are having this discussion and we're talking the, the message, the message that I've been, been uh, spreading with everything, everything that I, 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 I do, I owe to my knowledge of God. It's not belief is the simplest. Yes, belief, that's easy. The knowledge to know, to know why we're here. See, I've been, I've been blessed in every which way you can be blessed. I, I've been blessed with a, a, a great companion, a wife, uh, with kids, two wives actually, uh, a great parents, mother and dad, so real, so beautiful, so poor, but yet so rich, wealthy, with, with love, because that's, that's our, that's our riches. Remember uh, when they said, uh, a, a rich man can go through the eye of a needle. Uh, now, how does that work? Um, anyway, they're talking about a rich man getting into heaven is like going through the eye of a needle. And yeah. what, they, what they meant by that was that when you went into a walled city, you had to take all your goods off the camel and then put them through the door, the eye of a needle, they call it. They put them through the eye of a needle to show that there's no weapons, there's no contraband. They knew what you were carrying in there. And, and that's why they said about, that's why Jesus said about the wealthy, you know, it's easier for someone to go through the eye of a needle than to, to get into heaven with all your worldly goods. Because you don't, you don't. When you go to heaven, you don't, the only thing you bring with you is your reputation. Think about that. And we're all, we're only here temporary. You know, we're only here for, for tiny, a semester. That's what I call it. <laughs> yeah. I'm so that's, oh my God, semester. That, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, dear. yeah, that's Jesus. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to say other than like that's 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 beautiful, and I, I really love your outlook on life, and I'm sure that all the Catholics listening are, you know, are going to be offended and they're going to write letters. I'm just kidding. I don't care. It's just going to be my mom. But I've, I, I've, I've, I've literally. I've literally asked my mom, I'm like, hey, mom, you know, when you go to like mass on Sundays and you're on your knees praying to God, do you ever think about like those Spaniards that came from Spain and like forced all those Indians to like either become Catholic or be murdered? Do you ever think about that when you're praying to God? And then she's like, no, me home. I never have. And I'm like, OK, well, maybe think about it. And so, um, you know, just food for thought. I don't know. Well, <laughs> the thing is, everything the Catholic Church praises, you know, it is right on. I mean, everything about it is is right on. The only thing is, see, in order to make money out of religion, you have to have routines. You have to be able to teach a routine to somebody. And in order for them to get into heaven, they got to learn this particular routine. Now, it can be handed down from family to family, like the Jews do. Like, you can't be a Jew unless your mother's a Jew, you know. Uh, now, you can be converted, but to, to be you know, politically or whatever correct, they, they've got rules, you see. And what Jesus taught was that there are no rules. There, there's a simple rule, and that's to recognize our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's what you got to know. And what, the, what hallowed be thy name means is that God is 
we are is so powerful because God did make this world that we live in, this endless universes that apparently are endless in numbers themselves. And we still can't, there's no edge to anything. Everything is forever. And there's more forever and even more forever. And this is what cracks me up when they say, the universe is expanding. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's a lot of things that are expanding you know including humans <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> it's I... a physical world that's what you do in a physical world you either uh, go one way or the other you know and you keep expanding expanding until what happens you break apart <laughs> and you start all little 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 bits and pieces so the the, the thing is what we what what we have to learn and and oh by the way let, let me get real simple with it because i've been doing this someone asked me the other day he said you've been on 370 something podcasts <laughs> <laughs> why why is that I said, well the word gets out i get on one podcast and he said i had tommy chung oh man you got to hear this guy or <laughs> well, Tommy John, period. Teach you John. Oh, I want him on my podcast. So what happened to me? I was, first of all, I was blessed from birth, as we all are. You know, the story of Jesus being born in a manger, that's everybody's story, by the way. You know, it's not just Jesus, it's everybody. You know, immaculate conception. The father was definitely, he he was a he planted the sperm. You know, DNA showed that, but the mother does all the work, you know, let's face mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and we are all from heaven, every one of us, and we are all, are all eternal beings, every one of us, and it doesn't, like the universe is expanding, the human race is expanding, everything is expanding, because this is, this is the physical world. Now, what happened to me, I got turned on by this guy here. His name is Joel S. Goldsmith. Okay. He's a Jew. He's a Jew, but he, <laughs> he was also a Christian scientist uh, reader. And he was oh. also, he's also uh, a, a, um, uh, a Mason, you know, with all the, the, the degrees of Masonry. He, he, he was also a mason and he became a healer and 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 then he started giving talks and his talks turned into books because he, people would record him and he, and what he would when he would talk he would channel the the god he would channel the spiritual world and they would talk through him and 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 it became this book. This one's called The Master Speaks. Anybody in the book, he explains uh, our life, especially the Bible. He explains uh, the the Bible was written by by men and with great imaginations and the great writing, because you're when you're spiritually uh, uh, when you believe in God and you're, you're on the path, then everything you do, he will perfect that which concerns you. So no matter what you do, you do it at the, the, the highest level that you can possibly do. Like me, for instance. I played music with the best, in the best bands ever, in Motown, you know? I, I've... Uh, directed and been in movies starred directed and uh, produced movies i've never went to school I, i'm a high school dropout you know i couldn't pass uh, get into grade 12 because i i couldn't fathom uh, algebra and i tried a couple of times i tried when i was in prison and, and I failed algebra in prison and they wanted me to cheat. They said, we'll just give it to you. 
And, and I said, I can't cheat on a GED test in <laughs> Oh my God, Jesus. I guess there is honor in the prison system. I mean, that's very <laughs> admirable because for people- that, For that, I mean, I didn't have to go to school, but it was ordained for, like if you, you know, you're a kid from the ghetto or something, never had a high school, you had to go to school while you're in jail. And so I took that up right away. I worked in the garden actually when I was there. But what I'm saying is that I learned real early. And by the way, I do this. I, I talk about this on most of the podcasts that they left, the ones that left me. And, and what, what happens was that real early in my life, I, my mother had TB. So she was, in, she was quarantined. That's why the quarantine thing never bothered me because I, I never really got to hug my mother until I was uh, eight, nine, about eight years old, you know, because she'd been five years in quarantine. And, you know, and now it's like three years old when she got taken away. And then I went to a hospital for a year and then I went to a, a home, the Salvation Army home, like, a, a, yeah, orphanage. And so I was there for, for a couple of years. And, um, and, and so that's my early, early life, you know. I've been alone, but not alone. I've been with people all my life. See, not like some kids, you know, they were with their mom and dad their whole life or their uncles or whatever, you know, with me, uh, I was with nurses. My first memory was in the hospital with, with, with beautiful nurses hugging me and going, oh, look, at he's so cute. <laughs> me around. <laughs> so, so I got a real nice titty fixation real early in my life. <laughs> Found out nice and early you were straight with those yeah. boobies. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and then, nothing... and then, then, then when I went to the home, because I was so small, uh, and I, I I just stayed out of everybody's way. Uh, you know, my brother had a hard time because he was big enough to get bullied, and and so then he was tough enough to be become a bully if he wanted to be, and, and so my brother he, he kind of watched my back. But the whole point is, when, when you discover God, like I did, because I was in the Salvation Army home, which was an orphanage, and they, you, you never ate, you never did anything without praying for a, a whole lot of long time. <laughs> but the thing was, the food was so shitty that, that it takes as long as you want. <laughs> I can't eat this crap anyway. <laughs> and, oh, that's horrible. And, I, I I learned the value of a lot of things the hard way, but I also learned the key, the happiness key. It's called the golden key. Uh, there's another writer named uh, Emmett Fox. He talks about the golden key. Now the golden key opens uh, everything for you, and and what it is basically is this here it's how you yourself see the other person when you talk to anybody like airline ticket lady or cops or anybody and you look for the real soul of the person it's there and when you find it then you compliment compliment in other words you recognize the, the 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 soul of the other person even if they don't even recognize it you have the power to bring the soul out in everybody and by that's why some people uh do it naturally just what they're like that's santa claus basically santa claus is the best example yeah because everybody loves santa claus why because he sees you. He knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you've been <laughs> Dude, but you're, you're like skinny Santa Claus then because everybody yeah. loves Tommy Chong. Like, like yeah. I, seriously, only people who don't like you is the fucking feds. Excuse yeah, my language. Sorry, I slept. I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cuss. <laughs> the feds like me. You know? <laughs> I got to be friends with the guy that busted me. <laughs> oh, dude, that is above and beyond. Wow. That, 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't. Because he was just doing his job. See, there's an example of the golden key. There's an example right there. When they busted me, they were all in their SWAT uniforms and, and they had their weapons or AK 15s or whatever it was. And they had them on the ready and they, they come up to my house and, and we've got glass doors. And so they're out there banging on the door. And I, I came downstairs with my little jockey shorts on, you know, and look out. And they look like trick or treaters dressed like for Halloween, <laughs> you know, because they're young. Yeah, a lot of them are young and the helmets and shit, but they look like, <laughs> look like kids dressed up. You know? <laughs> it's like trick or treat. <laughs> But they were busting me, and 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 they come. In. We have a warrant, and you know, and we're going to take all your computers. And th- it was a drug bust, basically. And so they asked me, "Do you have any marijuana?" <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, <laughs> of course I do." And he says, "Where is it?" I said, "Well, every room in the house, I guess." <laughs> He's like, "Can you be more specific?" I said, "Well." I got a big butt on my workshop downstairs. And so he tells his guy, okay, go down and get it. <laughs> and the guy came back about five minutes later. He goes, I can't find it, sir. And so then I said, what kind of narc are you? <laughs> I said, right on the desk, it would bite. If it was a dog, it would bite you. And he says, oh, well, I don't, I don't have my dogs. No, I said, and now that's another thing. What kind of drug bust is this? You don't have a dog. You don't have your dog. And so the guy says, oh, never mind. Then he told the guy, he says, uh, take Mr. Chong upstairs and get him dressed. Because <laughs> I'm still standing there in my jockey shorts. And so they, they <laughs> put me upstairs. Now, this is when I got pissed off. They got me upstairs. And they found my little safety deposit box you know, all locked up. And most people carry, that have weapons, they carry their weapons in, in those boxes. And so the guy said, do you have any weapons in the house? I said, no. He says, okay, well, where's the key? So I got the key, opened it up. It's full of cash because we sold t-shirts. Yeah. And we sold them by cash. And so we had about twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in there. They call it drug money. But boom. They took the cash. What else? Oh, looking, oh my they, God! These they, animals. They looking, Jeez. Ugh. They were looking for weapons. And they couldn't find any weapons because that's what they give a shit about. With. And then we come downstairs. I'm all dressed, you know, and and so my wife now she's all dressed and everything, and she said to me, "Well, let's go get our coffee." And. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> We're being busted. She's yeah. So what? Come on. And so the guy goes overheard her, and he goes, uh, "Ma'am, we're not finished here yet." And she goes, "Well, are we under arrest?" And the cop says, "No." She says, "Well, then we're going to go have our coffee." And he says, "Why don't you go in the kitchen and make some?" And there was a woman uh, also busted with a, from the post office. And, and he says, and so and so will help you. And my wife says, "Fuck you! I need my Starbucks." <laughs> and, so, and and I'm I'm got my mouth open looking at it because the guy's got everything, you know. And she's down on the fuck off. <laughs> and he said, he he said to everybody, "Okay, that's a wrap." He <laughs> She literally kicked him out of the house with that. But they got the computers, they got everything they came for. They were just trying to bully us. And my wife does not get bullied by anybody. Oh, she is so cool. Dude, yeah. I I I mean I, I caught her on the Cheech and Chong Rose for the first time. That was my introduction to her. And I was just like, wow, that she is funny. She's cool. I was just like, you you deserve that. You deserve. I mean, oh, everything yeah. that you, you have. I mean, you're, you're... Well, she's really responsible for, for Cheech and Chong in, in so many ways because, you know, I'm, I knew her before I knew Cheech. And, and she was my friend 
and then we dropped acid together, made love, <laughs> and uh, yes. we've been together ever since. Yes, yes. Oh, I fucking oh, this is that's yeah. true romance right there because that's you know. Right. Like I tell people, I'm just like, you know, if you want to know if you're with your soulmate, you know, you drop acid with them. And yep. if they're willing to still suck your dick while they're looking at it all cross eyed <laughs> then they fucking love you. You need to marry that person. You, know, you really do. You need to marry that woman uh, or non-binary or, or dude or whoever. <laughs> In my case, she uh, she had this incredible business sense. She was born. Well, she's she's half Jewish. You know, her, <laughs> her mother is Jewish, and 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 her grandfather was a seamstress, uh, a tailor, a tailor, um, Goldstein, and so so she, 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 but you know she grew up in Canada, and so they ne they never, you know, they wouldn't admit Jews one way or another, but she is Jewish, and we've proven that many times, and she she is. Well, when I had the club, but well, th th to be honest with you, I had a nightclub and it was doing so bad that I tried to sell half of it to the parking attendant for a hundred bucks. And he would not, he said, because there's no one parking, we're not parking any cars, <laughs> you know? No, it's not a good deal. She, what happened with her, I was playing, we were playing in our band, you know, Little Daddy and the Bachelors were playing around town because we couldn't afford, to, you know, just be in our club. We had to go out and get side gigs in order to make money. She came to one of our gigs, really liked the band, of course. And, uh, and then when, uh, you know, we met and then she, she had me drop her off at this other club, the, the hip club. But she was so young at the time that the club wouldn't let her, her and her sister in. They weren't regulars by any means. In fact, their parents were out of town. And so the girls had no uh, chaperones or anybody to tell them to be anywhere. So they were on the town being wild. And, but when she uh, went to the first club, they wouldn't let her in. But she already had the address of my club. And so she told everybody with the near sight. Now, she's gorgeous. She is gorgeous. Always been gorgeous. And so she literally pie pipered everybody from the other club, <laughs> the, the hip club. She, they followed her over to our club. And our club after, after that night stayed packed every night for so, uh, close to seven years. Oh, my all God. All because of her saying, well, I know a club where I can get into. And then we were, we were just friends. And the reason we were friends was because she did not want to have a boyfriend. And she didn't, every time she'd go up with somebody, they would fall in love with her because she's so beautiful. And then they got very possessive. And, and it was just, no, she wasn't into that at all. And so when she met me, I was perfect because I'd see her at the nicest time and I had a wife and, and kids. So I, I was very, very safe. <laughs> I'm not gonna fall in love with her and she's never gonna end up with me. You know, I was just like a, a fun thing to do while she went to school because she, she was still in high school. Well, and then we tried to, I, I tried to break it off. You know, I went on the road, and then when I was on the road, I never talked to her. Uh, and I, I literally thought, okay, you know, because I wanted to set her free, you know, if we're not going to be together, you know, she's going to find someone else. Well, <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> that did not work. <laughs> and then we ended up, when LSD came into the, the, the time, we, we did a trip together, and uh, we've been together ever since. Oh my God. Do you at, um, have you, um, I don't know how to say this nicely, but are, are you still an LSD enthusiast? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I, I no, last time I did it was way in the seventies. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I was just wondering. No, because... no, I, I'll tell you, let's, let's go back. We talk about LSD and 
enthusiast. This is what came out of the asset trip. Because when I did asset, I got very into a very uh, spiritual mode, which, had, which I knew I always have been in. And so what happened to me, I started asking God to turn me on, you know? Yeah, okay, I want to learn more. How, how, how can I learn more? And when you ask for something, a lot of times it doesn't happen. All, it happens when you're ready. It's like cooking something, you know, you're baking a cake. You don't, you wait until it's baked before you pull it out of the oven. And that's what happens with a lot of humans, you know. You're, we're evolving, but we're not that quick that everything can come to us all at once. And so when, when she, when we got together and then I started going up the ladder as far as entertainment goes, you know, the band got better because we got a, a, a singer Again, very serendipity, you know, uh, we needed a drummer. The drummer that we had literally quit the band and then he's ended up with a group called uh, Three Dog Night. And that was Floyd. Uh, that was our original drummer. And Floyd is also my brother-in-law, married to his first, his sister. <clears throat> and so we had another singer named Bobby Taylor. He, he passed away a few years ago. Bobby Taylor was this genius singer that was troubled, you know, but he was troubled. He was, he was damaged goods, but he could sing. And uh, as long as he sang, he was okay. But when he could stop singing, <laughs> he, would, he, would, he would ruin his uh, life by being a gangster, you know, just being a ghetto rat, you know, just all of that, all of that, you know, the hard life. Yeah. And there's no one's fault. It's just his karma, you know, what he did. But he sang so good that Motown heard him, signed him right away. Uh, Dinah Ross and the Supremes heard Bobby sing. Phone Barry Gordy up. Barry Gordy flew to Vancouver and saw the group and signed us and then forgot about us because he really flew to Vancouver to get some booty from Diana Ross. <laughs> <laughs> it was a booty call. <laughs> and, uh, and a little bit of business with pleasure. And, uh, and so we ended up with Motown. We ended up with Motown. We had a hit record, which I wrote. And then, um, That's awesome. and then the Motown took Bobby and then I was left on my own, so I ended up coming back. And then I then I uh, I started getting into improvisational acting again, very serendipity, you know. And uh, next thing I know, I, I, I changed the, a strip club that we owned into a uh, improvisational club where we could do improv comedy, and that's how Cheech and Chong were born. That's where I met Cheech. And, and then when I met Cheech, then we got fired. We always got fired from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Why? We, or how? We on, yeah. When we got fired, then we went on to another gig. And <laughs> we went further up the ladder and kept going. Even to the point where in, Van, in LA, I once owned a comedy club. <clears throat> I found an empty club. Talk to the owner in to let me have it for for a night. Advertise that we're shooting a movie. Needed extras. Packed the club for one night, and Cheech and Chong performed along with another band. <clears throat> and uh, I I had a chance to own a, a nightclub, but the owner was so greedy that that, that he tried to screw us <laughs> out of nothing. <laughs> anyway, we got discovered the next week by uh, Lou Adler and uh, started making records and started becoming, you know, world famous. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, um, I, ca I caught your movies. You know what? I was really thinking about it because like, I caught you when I was a stoner 
as a sixth grader, um, when I saw half baked, completely stoned out of my mind. And it wasn't like, like, so you can't blame that one on Tommy Chong. You can't, um, nope. because like, that's when I discovered you. And then like other people discovered, discovered you after that too, like with the seventies shows and Zootopia with the younger crowds too. I recognized your voice. I was like, that's Tommy Chong. Oh my God. I was, I was, I was like, it, I got so giddy because I'm just like, I don't watch previews for movies. I just watch them. I don't care who's in them. And then like, I'm like, oh my God, they're, they're, they're this movie. That, like, that was them. Now look it up, look it up. Like, look it up right now. Like, you know, but it was, uh, it was so funny because I, I, I like, I love animation. Um, and well, I, Zootopia I, was a genius, genius animated movie, huh? Yeah, you played my a nudist changed, It changed my life, really, because for a long time, you know, I was a, a bodybuilder, and uh, and anything overweight was like, oh, you know, uh, it was terrible. But then I saw Zootopia, and then I realized that that in in the jungle, everybody exists. There's there's a, a tribe of everything, and everybody. And, and you have to respect it and appreciate it and enjoy it. And that's what I did. You know, it changed my whole attitude. Even to this day, even, even my son, my son gained a ton of weight. Um, it was a, a, what do you call it, a sympathy pregnancy with his wife. She was getting pregnant. Oh. And so, and he was a foodie anyway. And so he just went all balls to the wall and just came. <laughs> Uh, like like now he's in the process of uh, getting back to his, his his fighting weight, but yeah. but he and he wanted to be big. He wanted that experience, you know. And and being his dad, you know, I, I mean, to me, uh, I've always kept around. I've never gone over one eighty ever, you know, just one seventy five usually. And, and and at first, you know. He, he he came to me earlier and he and he said something like uh you know it was he said dad you went through this phase didn't you and i went uh, getting heavy and i did i did when i first started bodybuilding uh i was real skinny and so i wanted to gain weight and so i started eating and i just never stopped until i was 200 pounds you know, close to 200 pounds. And uh, so I, I know the feeling. And, and so, but then, you know, then I met my wife. Uh, and then when we started doing comedy, especially started doing movies, you know, then, then I'm, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to go to California was I, I learned how to bodybuild when I was uh, from bouncers and all the dances that we played at, you know, all the bouncers were fitness freaks. And, and I, I, I couldn't drink and I wasn't that much of a stoner, you know, but I was definitely into uh, bodybuilding. I got into bodybuilding when I was 15, I guess. And I went to the Y and, and the weight room was empty. <laughs> no one in there. And so I went in there and uh, started playing around. And next thing I know, I'm reading books and, and learned how to do it. And then I got turned on to the, to the Arnold crowd you know and so i was in la for oh good i guess about five years and and during that time i i uh, ended up <laughs> with cheech and and then but i was still into the gold's gym i was one of the original gold's gym at his first gym the very first gym and uh, and so I was seriously into bodybuilding to the point, you know, that we, we Cheech and I appeared on Arnold's uh, Mr. Olympia one time because uh, I was so connected there. But, <clears throat> but I learned, like I said, about life experiences. You know, when my son asked me, he said, Dad, you, you've been this you've been like this before and, I, and it was around two when i when i got married to my first wife because I, I i put on the, the weight but it was 
I wanted the strength more than anything. I've been skinny all my life. And so when I started, you know, filling out shirts and shit, <laughs> I said, whoa, this is, this feels good, you know, and then strong. It was, it was a nice feeling. Yeah, I was just about to say, it was probably super empowering, like yeah. to, to feel just so good and confident. And, you know, it's just everybody has, well, not everybody, but a large amount of people have like body dysmorphia and you know to be able to feel proud and you know i that's that's awesome man like you know i'm happy for you and like you know and i'm, I'm happy that you're still in good health and that you're you know you're, you're health conscious and you know um there uh i wanted to ask you um because you were public about your prostate cancer yeah and so i was wondering um a two-part question um what did you do to keep uh, mor your morale high? And did you take RSO? Well, mor morale was, I had no problem with that. Because like I said, you know, I've been spiritually inclined since I was a, a baby. And so when anything happened to me, I always take it as a learning uh, thing. Oh, I got to learn about this now. Oh, you know, and so when I got, the prostate cancer. I was in prison. That's why I got it. And you know why I got it is because I quit smoking pot. See, as long as I smoked pot, I was cancer free. But the the year I, I it was almost three years where I went without smoking anything, because I had to prove to the world and especially the the prison officials that Tommy Chong, when he when you tell him to quit smoking pot, he listens. And, and so I never smoked a joint, nothing. I never broke the law at all until I was totally off probation. And then, then I started smoking again. But what happens, because the cannabis is such a good medicine, it's also preventative medicine too. And, and I've, I've got friends that will swear by it, you know, that uh, everybody around them, you know, got cancer except them, you know. And so when I got prostate cancer right away, and like I, get, like I said, it was probably in the prison that I was in because it was, uh, the prison was built over a, a toxic waste dump. And oh as my a result, God. most of the, the guards that were there when I was there are gone, dead. Uh, some of the, quite a few of the prisoners and, and some uh, uh, counselors too. There's a Miss Strickland, beautiful, lady she was our camp our, our counselor but she she got cancer and uh, brain cancer and oh everybody in the jail they, and they had a thing in the prison called um what was it called uh, um it was a wasting disease um i can't think of it no fibromyalgia it, it was like um, sorry it was like the pandemic it was like the pandemic when the wind blew you know in the desert you had to come indoors and shut everything down uh desert uh what's it called almost had a desert fever uh typhoon no it was <laughs> uh wasting disease called <laughs> oh, you know. anyway uh that's what i that's where i think i got cancer because I got a lot of things. I got gout when I was there from too many uh, beans. <laughs> I love beans, but I, I can't eat them because there's too much high in protein and uric acid for me. And oh, so I, 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 I didn't got, know that. You'd think more Mexicans would have gout. Well, they probably do. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I... Oh, no, you assimilate. You, you, you know, when, whatever you grow up with, you know, it depends where you live. That's why they asked me, uh, a nutritionist said, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And so my usual diet was any, like potatoes uh, as opposed to corn, you know? Uh, and so I was more a potato guy, <clears throat> you know, or when you, got, when you don't have anything else, you got potatoes, you know? And I love fried potatoes. I love scalloped potatoes. Oh. I, love, <laughs> I, I love baked potatoes. I love a potato with, with all the, the stuff on it. Yeah, I still do. But I got cancer. And when I, when I got it, 
I went holistic right away. In fact, I had a healer in uh, British Columbia and, and, and we fought it for a good God, a couple of years, you know, and because they tell you when you get prostate, don't worry about it because you'll die of something else before that kills you. It's very slow, slow acting in some cases. But in my case, then I, then I got on Dancing with the Stars. And this when I still had prostate, but I wasn't doing anything with it. Well, Dancing with the Stars, I, I, I ended up with a tumor. On my in my rectum, and a real pain in the ass. And, and oh my God, Jesus! Sorry, that's hilarious. But that's I'm like my heart's going out to you. But then, I'm like, do wait, do I laugh? I'm, I'm fucking laughing. That I apologize. That's a real pain in the ass. It was a real oh, pain. Oh my God! So wait, was it like? Oh my God! That's so so to. Uh, it was a tumor and, and it was probably from all the stress that I suffered during Dance with the Stars <laughs> because that's when I got it. It was right around that time. And, and so when you got a tumor, you don't fuck around with that, you know. And so right away I went into, I got one uh, cancer doctor to look at it, <laughs> just stick his finger up my butt. That, that's what happens when you got, right, uh, what do you call it? Uh, cancer you know the what what, what do i got prostate prostate yeah yeah the, well when you get a tumor now you get the finger up the butt see and they feel around for the tumor and and do so they say they hate you at all or is it like you're sober or do they say oh, they hate no, you for that? you're fucking sober and i mean it's it, it you're being violated yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. It sounds like I they should at least give you some local anesthetics or something, or put you out entirely. You know, that's. I, I joke with these guys. I say, put on, <laughs> put on some jazz. <laughs> the light, light some candles. <laughs> oh. Use a lot of lubricant, man. Not a lubricant. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and there, and so I ended up going to this one doctor. Oh which was a mistake. And, and he's not in, in the business anymore, but he was an old army doctor and his only job was sticking fingers up guys' butts and, and checking for prostate. That was oh his my, job. Oh my God. So oh was, my God. And he wasn't, wasn't gentle. They're never gentle. And, and you get violated every time, but you're, you got cancer. It's fucking cancer and it's a tumor. So then I went to, uh, first of all, I, I arranged to get a doctor, a surgeon. He's going to remove it. And the old way of removing it was really bad because he, they had a whole thing, the talk they gave you. And it was, it was really bad, the old way of doing it. And, uh, but the new way of doing it is with uh, the computer. You go in there uh, with the, with the cameras, and then you just cut out what needs to be cut out. There's no violation of anything. And so I ended up with that guy, thank God. But when they took out the tumor, they also cleaned out the prostate. So the prostate got radiated at the same time. And so I, I'm all cancer free. Praise then, God, praise God. Then they moved the, the exit around to the front. So I have a colostomy bag now, and uh, which uh, you know right away as a comedian, I I named it the Donald. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh my God! Yes, that's that's so funny. Filled with hot air and shit. I was unaware of that, nor that. And I put it in my bag when I was doing stand up. I used to. I used to put that in my, uh, do my act with it. And uh, needless to say, I, I never got called back on many gigs, you know. <laughs> People were that offended by the, by the, by that joke or, or you just. Oh, no, the... no. I, I would do the whole talk about the, the prostate, you know, in the, in the, the bag, you know. Yeah. And, and, but it saved my life. And, and I had other friends that, 
they're still alive and, and they have the bag. The bag will save your life, you know, oh. because it, there's a shortcut now, and, you know, and there's a lot of pluses with it. And, uh, and oh. <laughs> uh, Ernest Borgnine, remember Ernest Borgnine? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay, he was in a show called Marty and he was married to a very beautiful lady and he got old. Like he was, he was in From Here to Eternity with Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the bad guy. Anyway, he was uh, getting up there. He was like 20 years, I think, older than me. And so, but the word out was that he, he was still sexually active as old as he was. He was like in his 90s, you know. And so I met him one day. And so I asked him, Ernie, do you, do you still have sex? And he could barely talk. Then he goes, I masturbate. <laughs> <laughs> That's so robust. Sorry. My high frequency of, of my cackle is disturbing your pet. I apologize. No, but isn't that perfect? <laughs> I masturbate. So when, <laughs> now, no one's ever asked me. No one's ever asked me, but if they ever asked me, I'd tell them the same thing, you know, about sex. Because, you know, prostate, as soon as I, you know, I stopped having sex, I guess, before I went into prison. And then when I got out, you know, forget it. You know, I tried and it, it was too painful. And so uh, technically, I haven't had sex since 05, I guess. And, uh, and so I never get asked, but if they ever ask me, I'm going to tell them the same thing. I masturbate. <laughs> Wait, hey, 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 um, Tommy, I have, I have a question. Um, do you still have sex? I masturbate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, I don't know. I guess there's yeah, other things you could do. And, you know. I got, no, I got to tell you. First of all, I'm with a very experienced uh, guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about yourself, right? He knows where to, he knows what to touch, where to grab, when to let go, when to squeeze. He, he's a pro. He's one of the okay. And and the thing you need to make it work is a great memory and a great imagination. See. <laughs> If more people would just stop there, there would be less people in jail. There would be less people uh, in court suing people. There would be less violated uh, ladies or guys. You know, I heard this joke. My, my daughter sent me this joke. Ray Dawn. The cops pulled over these two priests and they said, uh, Oh, we're looking for uh, a couple of child molesters. And the priest says, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Somebody unfriended me because I said something to the effect of, like, listen, no face fucker is going to save my soul. <laughs> and, yeah, it's just like, you know what? I, I, I might have been a little bit too blunt for the, you know, for some people. I mean, like, people are like, ah. They unfriend me and then they like accidentally text me because I'm a different victor than the one that they're I'm like, I'm the victor you unfriended from Facebook because there is no God. Oh. I, then I get blocked. Okay. But you know, it's just, you know, I like I like fucking with Mexicans. I'm Mexican. And like, you know, if you ever want to make a Mexican man uncomfortable, you you just say, Hey, hey Poppy. That's it. That's all you gotta say. Hey, Poppy. They gotta what? be Mexican. These Mexican men are super homophobic. Like for oh. reals. Like because well, it's that's true. Yeah, super homophobic. Like, hey, you got gay friends? You kick it with gay people? What? You you suck dick? You suck yeah. dick? It's like, dude, it's not like fucking like when you're hanging out with something, you're smoking a joint. I mean, I've literally seen people like not hit the joint the whole time I known them because they never smoke weed. But I mean, like everybody else did. So well, I don't. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, again, you know, it's it's how you're trained and what you're raised and the whole thing. You see. It's your belief system, but that's a hurdle, you see, because if we were all given that the message, you know, like I've, I've been given, 
you know, uh, and, and, and it's not a, a th you know, few are chosen, you know, uh, quite a few are blessed, but few, very few are chosen. I was one of the chosen ones, you know, I, I really was. Like I said, I never had a clue about Mexicans until I met Cheech. And Cheech was really the first Mexican that I'd ever really got to know. And, and getting to know him was, was a revelation. Because, you know, growing up in Calgary, like way, the way I did, uh, you know, it, it's, it's racist by design. You know, um, I for the record, I saw Cheech and Chong as a kid because, you know, we had a black box. And my parents didn't really give a shit what we watched. So like, um, I thought you were Mexican. Yeah, I really I legit thought you were Mexican. And I was like, oh, yeah, Tommy Chong. That's his stage name. It's probably, you know, Ching yeah. like, you know, because he can't say Chingon. You know, yeah. they can't put that on the marquee. They can't say Tommy Chingon. But, you know, it's Tomas, you know, Chavez or something like that. And then, yeah, it's yeah. Tommy Chong. And then it's like, then, then you know, you, uh, I get older and then, you know, I like realize like, oh, because I used to think that we were white and my dad was black because my dad's <laughs> a dark skinned Mexican. And like, so I really know, I swear to God, well, like yeah, in, in the culture, yeah. you know, the Mexican culture, everybody's called by, by what they look like. Yes, dark skinned, um, yeah. um, light skinned, yeah. uh, uh, brown skin. It's just yeah. like, and then also there's colorism. There, there, there's um, where like even like you know it's like oh yeah you know there's like no bigger hater of Mexicans than Mexicans, and yeah. that is fucking true. Nobody yeah. hates a Mexican like a fucking Mexican. Like holy and, shit, like yeah. um, hate. It's like like oh yeah they only you know they have money because of drugs or um oh it's just so fucked up and oh, you know yeah. that's just but but like i uh, i don't know like uh but that's see that, that that that's the great equalizer stupidity is the great equalizer what? stupidity no no bounds no color barrier nothing stupidity will come over you and you can't hide stupidity right you can hide up for a little while but eventually if you're stupid, it will show. And when it comes out, there you go. You go, oh, well, he's just stupid. That's what. That's how you can explain so many people, so many things going down, you know, the way it is going down, you know. Like, when we were doing our movies, you know, after we did Up in Smoke, uh, Cheech and I really couldn't get another movie going because we were assigned to Lou Adler. And uh, Lou Adler, you know, uh, took, took too much of his share. His share was too big <laughs> compared to what Cheech and Chong's share was. And so oh, we split, no. We split from Lou, and then we started, uh, you know, our own. And, and then that's when I took over and, and said, you know, we got to, I got to direct, I got to direct everything. And because I'm the director, I'm the writer, I'm the director. <laughs> and then I met a Jew named Howard Brown. And Cheech, I, I tried getting Cheech involved to get us out of the contract with Lou Adler. And the worst thing, Cheech, there was a couple of Mexican lawyers, but they weren't that good. You know, they weren't they weren't that good. They were they look good, they dress nice. You know, <laughs> very good looking, and they wrote the good haircut. You know, but they did not how know how to deal with Jews. And the truth is, if you want to make it in this world, okay, especially in LA, you need either be one, know one, hire one. You need a Jew, without a doubt. You need a Jew. <laughs> I'm so yeah, sorry. Howard, just... Howard Brown was my Jew. Cheech did not like Howard. He did not like Howard. Cheech's Jew was New York. Wait, Cheech's Jew? Jewish? Cheech's Jew. Like, he, he, wait. he hired a Jew in New York. Oh, oh, I thought you I thought you said he's a Jew. No, he, no. Like, because there's I, Mexican I, Jews. 
That's what I thought you were saying. Oh right yeah. Now. Oh, I'm. I'm no. I oh no. That. Oh no. No, I thought you were telling me right now that he was a Me- that he is a Mexican Jew no. or 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 was back in the day or I don't no, know. No, but, no, no. Because people. He, did, he he got kind of hung up with Geraldo Rivera, you see, and Geraldo Rivera is half Jewish, but that's not good enough. It wasn't the right half. We needed the other half. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't need the Latino half. We needed the the Jew half. Well, yeah, you know, you get a you know better rate with the Mexicans because you know that's somebody's cousin, and you know they they know oh. each other from back. Each family knows each other from back from you know a certain city within a certain state, and it's just oh, yeah. like oh yeah. So all of a sudden it's like yeah, that they, they, I have to hire them because. Yeah. You know, like my aunt got fingered by their uncle. It's like, what the fuck? Like, I don't know. <laughs> why, why do I gotta, you know, pay pay for other people's misdeeds? Well, Cheech, Cheech did not like the Jew that I hired. He didn't like my Jew at all. Is it because uh, you hired them, or were they just like like well, making him do shit he didn't want to do? Or he, oh, sorry, that might have been too Howard, forward. Howard Brown recognized right away that I had the power. You yeah. see, whoever d- writes and directs holds the power you see that's the power and i was the writer and director and so uh we did what the four movies together and then then cheech got really tired of being of me being the director so he he went on his own and uh, did uh, born in east l.a you know that was his his uh, solo and that was why we broke up you know he, he because when he wrote his movie, see, when I wrote my movies, he was uh, the star, <laughs> not just a co-star, he was a star. But when Cheech wrote his movie, I wasn't even in it. <laughs> oh, oh, man, that, uh, I mean, uh, Jesus Christ, I don't want to get involved. But Jesus, that, that, uh, I'll get involved. That's OK. You know what? That's really fucked up. I'm going to fucking go on record. That's fucked up. And yeah, that, like, like that, uh, dude. I would have been fucking kissing your ass if you would have been the fucking brains, would, and uh, it made yeah. me a star. You made me a fucking star, dude. I'm making fucking movies. You're, you're, and, and whatever you want, bro. You want to direct it? You want to help co-write it? You want to change some scenes around so you can like fuck like twenty chicks in the in in, in in my in the feature film? Then yeah, dude. Yeah, because you're helping. You you. Uh, uh, you both helped each other become stars, and, and you know, like, you, and he, what, what, what especially happened, you. <laughs> what happened? <sighs> he he was raised. He used to be an altar boy. Yeah, he was an altar boy. His dad uh, was a cop. Ended up a sergeant of LAPD. Taught criminology. Cheech was raised so straight, so straight that. That I mean, if 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 his hair got a little long, his dad would go crazy. Cheech, and then when after our success, then Cheech realized that that he didn't have to play that Chicano anymore, and so then that was the end of that. But as long as he was going to be dealing with me, he's going to have to be that character because that was our trademark. But yeah, I was just also though it's so iconic and like yeah. it was instant he hit, right? It wasn't like like it became want, a <laughs> sorry. To this day, to this day, he did not want to be typecast as that low rider. He did not want that at all. You see, and that's why when he went with Don Johnson, he became a cop. And and by the way, Don Johnson, she doesn't like to believe this, but he. Uh, he offered me the job the same time he offered Cheech, <laughs> but I was already doing that '70s show, and and so there was no way I was going to become a cop, especially a sidekick, you know, to anybody, you know, not after doing movies like we did. I mean, you know, we 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 were hugely, and we still are, we still are up there, but. Uh, Dude, I no. purposely smoked a strain of weed because, like, it had your name on it. Yeah, I literally, I wrote a r- review about it, like, because, like, I literally, like, because I do have chronic pain and, like, I do, you know, smoke weed because of the pain. And I literally, I was just like, you know, like, uh, no matter what you, you're gonna have to, like, dude, it's 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 your reputation. Everybody knows you. It's like 
they had a high THC. It was like over 30% or it was like 30.45 or something like that. I'm not a numbers whore either, by the way, but it was very, very dense buds smoked a joint went on a walk it was fucking incredible i like i was like i'm writing a review about i like i wrote like a three paragraph review about oh no cannabis cannabis marijuana man i mean everything everything i got i owed uh, i I owe to that thing and meeting cheech and by the way cheech and i when we first started out we we never did any really heavy pot jokes we did a couple but not really until we came to LA and then we were working in the Valley in Encino and uh, it was a, a dance club and we got, we were hired to do two shows. And after we did the first show, dancers were kind of pissed off because they had to stop dancing in order to listen to a couple of guys be funny, you know, and dancers are, you know, a rare, you know, different kind of breed, you know, they don't, they're not comic fish, you know, and so we never went over it so good with, that, with the first show. So then I told Cheech, I said, again, it's very serendipity. I said, there must be a character that you can, we can do that's really going to get these people. And she said, well, there is one. But uh, I said, what do you mean, but? He says, well, you know, it's a little bit detrimental to the, to the, the Chicano uh, experience, I said. We're comedians. That's their job. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do. And so then he came up with this lowrider character. And I come up with a bit of the car because I used to see this one black comedian do about uh, 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 called the, the date. And he'd go on a date and he'd pretend he's driving a car and he'd clean off the car. And he had all sorts. You saw the car. You know, you just do it. <laughs> So I tried to teach that. And so, so next thing you know, we invented the lowrider. And the minute Cheech got, first of all, he comes up there and rushes off the car. You see the car, he, the way he cleans it. And then he opens the door and he gets in. And then he, I'm just a love machine. Don't work with nobody, you know. And then I come out, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. That was it. Went, we, we, we got halfway through the bit and the crowd was going so nuts. <laughs> we were going so, and I heard them, man. I, when you hear, I had a, uh, an old, uh, the, the, he was an old roadie for Lenny Bruce, the road manager. In fact, he was married to Lenny's mother, Sally, for a bit, for a year. They went on a honeymoon. They had a great time. But Tony, Tony was my muse. And, and when, I, when I met Tony, uh, Tony, he, he said, you know, we were the closest thing to Lenny Bruce that he's ever seen. He, he recognized it right off the bat. Wow. What a compliment. Jeez. That's that. That means raw, powerful, hysterical, yeah. synonymous yeah. with like, hey, we're making yeah. the rules and this yeah. is what's funny. Yeah. And guess what? You're going to love it. And yeah. um, it, it's yeah. fucked up because sometimes comics never learn that. No. And it's it's horrible because it's just like, what, what, what? you don't even believe in your own jokes. How are you going to get other people to believe in your own jokes? That's and so. Funny. And I'm writing, like, I'm sorry, not I'm writing. I just finished my first screenplay. I'm trying to, I don't know how much I should reveal, but it's pretty much like the, I'm trying to, I, I, I'm trying to emulate, um, I will not emulate, but I'm just trying to make like, like a, a, um, the next Mexican stoner Friday, but it's not Cheech oh, and Chong. Great. I'm not stepping on any toes. Great. I'm not stepping on any toes. No, 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 no step all over. <laughs> no, 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 it's just, no, 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 the having, because I've done stand up comedy with yeah. a partner before and yeah. doing stand-up comedy with a partner in my experience has been like way harder than doing it by yourself because it's, oh, yeah. because not only do you have to have timing, you, you, your partner has to have timing. And so, yeah. and then both your timings have to just, 
bounce off each other in a way right. where it's just theatrical and and so and beautiful like it's just it's like wow it's so natural and it like like you know that's outside of looking in you're just like you know how many times we've done this how many times like you know by the time you know we we see the end product it's just like wow wow it's just uh so i i, I was wondering so as a screenwriter um who are uh, I wrote my first script. I just say I'm all cocky and arrogant. Who <laughs> gives a shit you wrote a movie? No, but I mean, do you have like any advice for writing comedy movies since you have a lot of experience writing iconic, legendary? Do you have, do you have a cast? Do you I have, have I mean, gonna, like to be honest. The first thing you want to do with any screenplay is have it read, have a, have a reading, you know, sit around, get actors, get people to read the different parts and, and then and go through scene by scene and read it and record it record the the thing uh the the different things and then see who who you can get for different parts in, in the screenplay but be very careful make sure that you register the script with the the writers guild oh i i did one better i i copywrote it i copyrighted it with the yeah. Uh, what, library of congress yeah and yeah so yeah, i'm I, I, and so like i i was like i could shoot you the script because it's like you know it's registered and so it's yeah. good it's good until i no, die plus 70 years unless you got someone that want you know that will read it but you want to get the actors you want to hear that script as a movie you know there's no shortcuts oh into it anyway you know you're going to have a reading so have reading have it listen to it see where you can tweak it if you can't tweak it anywhere then then uh, make sure you got it recorded record the read record the read because a lot of times people you know they don't have time they're, they're listening to all these different scripts they're reading scripts every day and it doesn't take uh, too long to go okay i like it or it needs work or, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, the, the, the golden rule always has been a name. You need a name. I, I once had Lou Adler look at a, a musical and he gave me some great advice. He says, for musicals, you need tunes that are recognizable that other people recognize. You know, if you get too original, then it's uh, no one has any way of going uh, yeah, investors, you know, if you do something original, then be prepared to raise the money, do it all yourself. If you're going to do it, if you want money to come in, then you got to aim at a certain, uh, uh, what, you know, a target and then do it that way. But if you, if you got your, your script copyright, then start putting it to life, get people to read it. And then, because you can always read it and when you can always tweak it, you know, there's always things that you can tweak or there's a lot of things you can add. You say, you know, oh yeah, this is good, but we, we need something else. We, you know, a little something here and something there, you know. And then the other thing you got to do is what period is it in? What yeah. clothing, what, what look, what do you want? How can you make see that was Cheech's genius was when he discovered when he designed the lowrider, he designed every bit of that costume. Look how iconic that costume is. Cheech, he designed the yellow, the red suspenders. He, mm -hmm. he had a vision, man. He had a vision what you're doing, and, and that's what you want to do with yours. You know, you got a good character, you envision how he looks. Get it on tape as soon as you can, and then sell that motherfucker, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Thank you. Jesus. Oh, uh, no, because, like, I, and I'm not trying to name drop here, but, like, I made a new friend um, who's actually, like, he used to be the main writer on Phineas and Ferb on Disney. Um, oh. And um, he was, like, a total, he is a total sweetheart. And he's all like, he's all, he saw one of my, he saw me do stand up on Zoom and he was like, and he sent me a message. He's like, 
you're hysterical. And I was like, oh, thanks, because I get a lot of complaints. So I screenshot it and I sent it to the producers. And like five minutes later, they sent me the Wikipedia back. It's like this guy's like uh, Emmy nominated writer and music composer. And I'm like, oh, that guy thinks I'm hilarious. And then he asked me, if he, he's like, have you ever uh, considered writing scripts? And I handed him two scripts right there on the spot. I was like, I was wondering if you could like look at these and you don't have to or I could pay you. And like he was like super cool about it. He's like my, he's like my writing mentor now. And I'm just like, I don't, I, I don't deserve this. I don't like I don't deserve you to give me these gems. But I'm so glad I asked. You know, maybe I am. But I don't like it's just like the the the, the stars aligned in a certain way for me to talk to you today. You know, and uh, Linda Marcus Smith. She was a big role in, in this. I wanted to give her a shout out because I, I was so excited about naming all the people that, you know, I had recorded episodes with and people that said that they were down to do it. And she, she told me, hey, she just sent me a message at like two o'clock in the morning, just randomly. And she's like, do, do you want to interview Tommy Chong? And I'm like, and I got anxiety. And I was like, are, are you are you kidding me? <laughs> like 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 Ch Cheech and Chong Tommy Chong. She's like, yeah, yeah, of, of course. I was like, yeah, of, of, absolutely. I would love to if he's down. If he's, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what he's up to. You know, right now, the second, you know, like you know, with the pandemic and everything, and you know, maybe he doesn't want to do it because I'm not a celebrity or I, I don't know. And it's like, oh no, no, he's a he's a sweetheart. I was like, oh no, I know he's a sweetheart. I'm just like, I don't, I, I'm just not sure if he's gonna want to do my podcast. So it's just like, I'm like really like super appreciative of you and your time and your wisdom and just everything because like to be honest with you, like I I I didn't go to sleep last night. It was like I took a fucking I'm sorry. I, it's like I took a huge bag of coke last night. And I swear to God, I didn't take any drugs. Okay, I took sedatives, but it's just like I, um, for my anxiety, it was so um, clonazepam. But at any rate, um, it's just like I, I couldn't sleep. Is that anxiety? Because I'm just like, oh my god, I don't want to fumble this. And then I'm like, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? It's like, dude, you're not, you don't, you, you know, it's not, it's not like I'm racist and I'm gonna say something racist and then, oh well, shit, I can't publish this now or you know, <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's just like, what's the worst that's gonna happen? You know, Tommy Chong's gonna think I'm an idiot or not funny or a fat slob or, or some comment. <laughs> so it's just like these are the the insecurities that are like going on yeah. in my brain. So I'm just like, but but the the, the gems of of just everything and it's like also I had like. A, I have like a bunch of like weed related questions, but it's just like, I don't want to undermine this interview because it's been so deep. I don't want to be like, yo, sativa hybrid. <laughs> it's just like, dude, I just talked to you about life and the, the universe and how, how awesome everything. No, I mean, so I, I just, but, but, you know, it's just, I, I asked a bunch of people like, does anybody have any questions? for Tommy Chong because I'm going to interview him and a bunch of people I got a bunch of wow reactions like could not believe it and I'm just like well we'll see you know he might he might flake out we, we don't you know maybe but like um uh, I wanted to ask you this question because this this stuck out to me out of all the questions that I got I got a ton of questions and um this is like this one stuck out to me and it's uh the character of Cheech played strongly upon the stereotype of the 1970s Chicano and Cheech's Mexican heritage. And one could argue as a result, Cheech became a Latin American cultural icon. In contrast, Chong's Chinese heritage is rarely emphasized. And there are very few Chinese American stereotypes applied to the character of Chong. Was this a conscious decision on the part of Tommy and Cheech? And if so, why did they make that choice? If it was not a conscious decision, do you have any thoughts as to why that dynamic ended up being that way? Good question. Well, the truth is, like you, you thought that I was Mexican. And the, the truth is, yeah, I'm more Mexican than I am Chinese. Because even though I, I learned how to cook, Chinese. I had a Chinese girlfriend for a little bit because the Chinese uh, race really disowned me. You know, the minute, you know, the Chinese by, by nature, they're very, very uh, racist in as far as tribalism goes, you know, uh, like if you, if, if you don't, it's like the French, 
you know, like if you're from uh, the country, you know, the French have a snobby way of treating you as opposed to if you're from the city. And the Chinese are the same way. If you're mixed in any way, then you're not Chinese as far as they're concerned. Uh, and then if you are Chinese, then, then you're either Cantonese or Mandarin. And if you're Mandarin, well, you're sort of like on one side and, and, and it goes on and on and on. And it goes into the caste and money and everything else. So technically, I'm more Mexican, like you said. And the reason being, when I was in army cadets uh, in Vernon, BC, <clears throat> the badasses of the town were zoot suiters, or uh, they were like white pachucos, wh white guys w adopting the, the Mexican mode of clothes, you know, the draped pants, the, the whole look, the hat, the, the, the chains, the, the slouch, the cigarette, all of that it was a pachuco. And when I was a teenager, I, that, I, want, I loved the pachuco look. I never had the money to really afford any of the clothes. And one time I, 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 I tried to sew my own um, drape pants. I tried to make my own drape pants. It was pretty sad. <laughs> but uh I was gonna say that's pretty fly, man. I mean, if you had the yeah. skills to, to to make that, that's pretty that's pretty cool. Like that's, yeah, no, that's resourceful. The, like the look in the in the long hair, the long hair with the ducktail. See, that was <laughs> pure pachuco as opposed to Cheech being uh, you know an altar boy, you know. So <laughs> so I was more a pachuco mentally too. You know, the, the mindset of mine was, you know, that's where I got the anti sort of cop attitude, you know, it was more. Uh, and then when I started, when they added the, the stoner in there, you know, the doper, the again, it was hanging out. Well, look, at look, 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 look at the, our first manager, the, the Lenny Bruce guy, Tony Vascara was was his name. He was Lenny Bruce's uh, um, road manager for a while, and he was he married Lenny Bruce's mother. Well, he was a Chicano. He was uh, Tony Vizcarra, man. He had done time in jail uh, for being in a gang. He shot a kid one time accidentally with a zip gun. He 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 was running and they tripped and he the kid in front of him got shot. And, and oh, Tony, shit. well, Tony became my mentor in a sense that he helped me with the comedy just by criticizing. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, this is too relatable to me. That's too relatable. It's just yeah. brutally honest friendship or yeah. just like, listen, you could do better because you're wasting my time. Well, right he, now. he told us, you know, we, we, we do a show, you know, and, and like we're opening for Cannonball Adderley or somebody, and we we do a show. And we kill the audience. Oh man, they're almost standing ovation. And awesome. Tony said, "Relax, man." He says, "When when you see when you go to a, a theater and the lineup around the block is there to see you, <laughs> now you can feel good about yourself. But if you're there to see someone else and you come up and entertain them, all you did was entertain them." You didn't do shit. And, and, and <laughs> that's what it was. Well, that's Tony Vizcarra. See, Tony was a real live pachuco. He was the live zoot suitor. He was the guy. And Tony and I hung together. In fact, I asked because he hung with Lenny. He was the one that gave Lenny his last uh, bit of heroin that killed him. Oh, you Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. And, and so Tony, I asked Tony, I said, Tony, what's the big deal about heroin? And Tony didn't say a word. He reached in his pocket, pulled out a little tab of heroin and gave it to me. Well, what <laughs> it, wait, was it China white or was it black tar or like? What? It was kind of, it was some kind of uh, uh, brown. It wasn't white at all. It was brown. Was it sticky or was it powdery? It was, as far as I know, it was uh, powdery. Sorry, I don't mean to like grill you because, okay, so that's more China white. 
um, because I used to be, I'm, I'm a recovering addict. I used to do black tar. And so I, you know, I found a method like, I, like, you know, monkey see monkey do. I learned yeah. from like, you know, the, like the, 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 the prince of the poppy seeds, because yeah. this dude like seriously knew how to have like, like he would filter it out with an oral syringe and cotton. And I'm, he had this whole system and it's, it was incredible. I'm like, I don't know how you figured this fucking out, but this is fucking genius. Well, uh, Tony, Tony and his girlfriend, Diane. I'm glad you didn't like it. <laughs> Why well, didn't do it? Oh, oh, my bad. Oh, I didn't do it. I'm glad you didn't do it. Then. I put it in my pocket, took it home, hid it in my sock drawer. Every once in a while, I'd take it out and look at it. And then finally, I just flushed it down the toilet because I knew, I knew how dangerous it was. I know how dangerous it was. I've seen it all my life. You know, growing up in Vancouver, I seen people laying in the gutter with a syringe in their arm. You know, yeah. I've seen it and, and I work with people that were perfectly, well, they're all dead now. They're all gone. Everyone, everyone, they're all dead. And, and so I knew, I knew better. And so what I did with Tony, I, as we progressed, Cheech and I progressed, I tried to get him on the road as a roadie, but, but he, he was <laughs> too old really. And he wasn't up to carrying heavy shit around or you know making sure the guitars were there he, he just wasn't up up for it and so what i did i made him a writer in uh, nice dreams for nice dreams and i gave him a contract and he was a, he was a screenwriter and so tony said well what do you want me to write i said write a, a script about your 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 uh, life you know in your thing and he took <laughs> tony so he was such a good com 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 comedy writer. He told me about his time in this halfway house, which was a motel. It was on uh, like Kwanga around out there in Hollywood Hills. Uh, but it was a halfway house for, for all sorts of people with mental problems, junkie, you know, heroin problems, all sorts of things. And Tony was in charge of medication. <laughs> He, it was like a halfway house and he's in charge of medication oh god i can only and imagine so tell me all these stories about the characters that were in this halfway house and he i have i had him write a script and i got the script somewhere here well halfway through the movie tony od'd he 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 Every every cent i gave him he put it in his arm oh wait oh, oh my god <laughs> every penny oh my god he just but he went out he went out happy he went out the way he wanted and uh and it was uh, when he got the last check that was the last and i and i get a call from the ambulance driver you know and they're driving tony and they want to know um, are you responsible for this man and i said no <laughs> oh my god <laughs> That's a hell of a fall. You're a man. What did he? Well, that's a whoa. That's oh my god. That's that's because, horrible. How old was he? I, I didn't want to pay. I didn't want to pay that. The, 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 hospital, the hospital bill. Oh, the whole thing. The whole thing. You know, thousands of dollars if you, if you pay it. You know, and oh so, my god. so so anyway, Sally is um, his ex-wife actually, Lenny Bruce's mother she paid for the funeral and we buried tony in he's he's buried in a, a plot in um, in the downtown la or you know riverside you know the the funeral home there and we had a couple of uh, comics jackie gill was one of the pallbearers and uh, Carrie and tony he swore tony everywhere we went He's carrying Tony, you motherfucker! You would have to get the the the, the site on a hill. What the fuck, Tony? What could you? Have? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was. Oh my God! God. The poor, poor, the whole family's there just listening to this guy. We laughed, we laughed, we laughed so hard. And oh there must God. have been, there must have been ten, maybe eleven ex-girlfriend wives girlfriends 
all morning, Tony. You know, he was a handsome guy, and he had he had it going. Oh yeah, oh, Tommy, yeah. I I I gotta say it, man, because like I have something in common with I I lost a friend who overdosed by accident uh, because it was laced with fentanyl. And he was a he inje- he was a heroin user. And um, we went we went to his memorial and like, you know, it was a rough crowd because like nobody was clapping and people gave some really heartfelt speeches. And then they opened it up and had these cordless mics. And he had like girlfriend after 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 girlfriend. There was at least 12 women that testified about Mark was my boyfriend. I used to go out with Mark, Mark's girlfriend. Like uh, we went steady and all the, like, but every chick was trying to outdo the last one. And then the last chick who spoke, she's like, uh, she really said this in front of like at least 250 people. She said, Mark, he was just a really great guy. I dated him in middle school and then again, in high school. And then again, after high school. And, you know, Mark was a really talented uh, uh, artist and he was an excellent musician just great drummer animal lover mark was just a such a great guy you know what i wish mark was here right now so we could rock my world one more time yeah. i was like dude she should have just dropped the fucking mic it was yeah. oh my god i was like that's how i want to go out that's how i want to go that's the <laughs> memorial i fucking want and oh my god so like you know you're telling me about about your your friend and all these girlfriends coming to mortem and it's just like hey who the fuck are you hey who are you who are you who are you who are you and it's just like yeah mine had microphones mine had my <laughs> that's horrible that's horrible it's just it's just i mean and it's 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 fucked up because i can't talk about it on stage because like you know i don't know his i i know his parents and you know as well and if they listen to this episode you know I did. I did love their son. He was one of my best friends. So, you know, I feel that Mark would be cool with me joking about it. I really do. Well, and, I, um, I did a funeral. Uh, my ex landlord, and then he became my uh, gardener and caretaker for the houses that I bought. Um, and when he died, uh, I, I had to do the uh, speak for it. And, and so I did a bit that was true you know because um because frank frank it was italian and uh i i got a I, he he started right at the end of his life toward the end of his life he grew his hair real long and started smoking pot you know up until then he was a good you know straight uh, italian uh, homeowner gardener you know, he was a master gardener. He, he had a farm in Italy. But anyway, the story I told was that he, <laughs> he uh, was taking care of my house. And I had a apartment, uh, a, 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 quite a bit of land in Bel Air. And the land went up a hill. And halfway up the hill was a, a, a natural stream. And so he built a cistern uh, with a natural stream, like a big pool of water. You know, and then he would uh, water the garden with that natural stream. But he also had an area where he grew something like about 40 pot plants. (laughs) Because I had hippies, I had hippies uh, work on my house. And and back in the day, they would get their weed that had seeds in it. Yeah, and they would clean the weed and the seeds, and and so Frank found this big bag of seeds, and so you know he told me I, I, I put a few plants here and, uh, <laughs> and everything grow, you know. Oh my God! Then yes. He, then he learned how to pee on the perimeter so to keep the deer away, and they grew to be 16, 16 feet high, sativa. Oh, they were the best weed some of the best weed i've ever had in my life really so, that's awesome yeah. oh. so i told him but we had a neighborhood kid in the that was sneaking in and stealing uh, no the weed yeah oh, what yeah. a prick and so he came in there with a garbage bag 
And so Frank knew, you know, he could tell that where something was going on. And so Frank sat up there one night with, with a gun in his la on his lap and, and waiting for the guy. And sure enough, the kid shows up, starts stealing the weed. And just then he, Frank says, okay, you son of a bitch, you drop it the bag or I'm gonna shoot you in the ass. <laughs> and when someone tells you where they're gonna shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that is, that is incredible. But so the was... kid, so the kid stopped, he, he dropped the bag and then he, of course he went home. So I had a, uh, so the next day Frank told me what happened. So I walked down to the, I knew what house it was, you know, it was a rock and roll house. And so I walked over to the house and the music is playing real loud. I knocked on the door, music stops playing. Dad comes to the door, yes. I said, listen, your son's been stealing plants out of my garden and I want him to stop because he's gonna get hurt. Someone's gonna get hurt. He said, what kind of plants? I said, marijuana plants. He said, isn't that illegal? I said, yes. So you tell him to stop fucking with my plans. And then the dad says, I'll tell him. <laughs> and, and that was it. No more, no more problem with the, with the kid. That was the end of it. Oh I, my. Told that, I told that story <laughs> at Frank's funeral. And there was the biggest, everybody it was a release everybody laughed because that was so frank you know he had the ability to grow and, and then to save the plant what he grew you know oh, oh was, my god that is god but i mean seriously though i mean that's oh my god like the fact that you went and you you delivered the eulogy that's yeah. that's really big of, of of you because like it's just like it, you're busy you know, you have a lot of stuff going on and it's just like, I really like for you to go out of your way to do all that. And then to help people that are mourning really speaks a lot to Ooh, to have a laugh. Oh, they laughed. They laughed. They loved it. They loved it. I mean, they were still mourning the guy, but. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. But I mean, I mean that, that's the whole point of, of what we do for a living. You know, our job is to make people laugh regardless of the situation, you know. And uh, yeah, I love that. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I, I want to be very respectful of your time. Uh, you've given me a lot of your time. Um, you got have any more questions? Yeah, I actually just had, um, I actually have a ton, but I want to get to the most important one. Um, okay, so um, I wrote my senior thesis at the University of California, Santa Cruz, my upper division sociology requirement. Uh, I wrote a senior thesis called the attitudes and effectiveness of drug education in the American public school system. And it was about the dare program and we pretty much found out based on qualitative and quantitative research, you know, with like numbers, like, and all that stuff that there is, um, um, people that, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the program failed. And it made kids more um, likely to use drugs and not just um, cannabis or marijuana, but like harder drugs. And because they were um, tempted because of the D.A.R.E. program, because it was just say no. And so I was wondering if you had any ideas or thoughts on how uh, drug education should be handled in the American public school I system. Do. I do. In fact, I did it uh, last week. We had a, a session, it was called Cannabis um, Therapy. It was Cannabis Therapy Session. And what we did, I, I tested it out like I'm the patient. Uh, I smoked a joint and then uh, my guide that was taking me through the session uh, start, did a, we did a meditation you know, and then I put on earphones and I laid down and I listened to music, healing music. And part of the, the, the therapy is that you talk while you're listening and, and words have a, a tendency to 
to linger longer if, if it's done with music, you know? And what happens is that you're, you're, it relaxes, the music relaxes your whole body. So you can take in a lot of, a lot of information. And the information that I was talking about was the power of, of God, the power of the human experience, the power of, uh, the power that we have within us and how to use that power. And um, the, the session lasted for about, I guess about an hour. It could have gone on longer, but I, I got, I was so revved up with the, with the idea. I kept thinking in my head how this could be used in therapy, you know, because it really is like a therapy session, only instead of using acid, or any uh, ayahuasca or any any kind of uh, mind altering uh, substances, use cannabis because cannabis is more gentle on it, and it and, and you don't get taken away that deep. You know, sometimes it's good. Well, for me, it was good, but it was only a one time thing with the acid. But the cannabis is like daily, and so I what I see now doing halfway houses, rehab houses, using cannabis therapy, where you smoke up or you, you toke up with the bongs or whatever. And, uh, and then you have uh, someone talk to you, talk to your subconscious more than anything and remind you of who you are, what you're capable of doing and, and how, how to, to loosen, uh, how to lose bad habits, you know, and 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 re really, the, the only thing I would add to this now, the way the, the, my guy did it uh, was that he used more um, uh, uh, more yoga technique, you know, where where. Uh, you clear your mind and, and so on. I want to use more uh, music and uh, and the spiritual technique, the Goldsmith, the Goldsmith book, because I see um, if if you just read this, is what I did with my daughters when I was sick with cancer, I had my daughters come and read to me. Uh, and and so as they read, it affected their life. And so this is an, an example, an ex excerpt of, of the, the book called The Master Speaks. And as people are laying there with the headphones on, this is what they're hearing. Illumination dissolves all material ties and binds men together with the golden chains of spiritual understanding. It acknowledges only the leadership of the Christ. It has no ritual, no rule, but the divine, impersonal, universal love. No other worship than the inner flame that is ever lit at the shrine of spirit. This union is the free state a spiritual brotherhood. The only restraint is the discipline of soul. Therefore, we know liberty without license. We are un a united universe without physical limits, a divine service to God without ceremony or creed. The illuminated walk without fear by grace. That's beautiful and very thought provoking and just I really like I, I like I've had I've had a lot of epiphanies talking to you today and to, to be honest with you, like what I thought was going to happen and what happened, I, I'm so happy it worked out the way that it did because I really feel enlightened, I feel empowered and I really feel like 
I, I, I'm so lucky to just have you um, educate me with learning more about myself, learning more about what's out there and to try to sell my script. Jesus Christ, what the hell am I doing? But, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you know, but no, uh, is there anything you want to plug before I, uh, we, we, we part ways? No, the only thing I want everybody to do, especially yourself, is to get these books. This is a Joel S. Goldsmith book, okay? Okay. And, and, and there's one other book. His name is Emmett Fox. Emmett Fox. And his is the Ten Commandments. His is the book that, these are the two books that I read without, without fail. This is, oh no, this is a Patrick Lane book. No, I, I got, the Emmett Fox always gets uh, borrowed or something. But get Emmett Fox, get Joel Goldsmith. And read them every night and, and read a different chapter. Uh, you, you'll love them. You, you'll love them. He, he, he's on online, you know, Gold, Joel S. Goldsmith. You can get him online. All the books he's got in there. Uh, I think you can get some uh, um, uh, audio books if you want he, he has some tapes where he actually talked in the tape his voice is kind of funny sounding but i i love him i love the guy i love the whole thing but that that's 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 what you got to do we all have the power you know like we're you know like i have a tesla electric car and and uh, and i realized that tesla it's so advanced that I will, in my lifetime, I will never conquer everything that that car can do. <laughs> you know, there'll be something that, oh, that's how you do it. Like I just learned how to use Siri, uh, you know, just, just recently. And I still don't know how to, you know, or Alexa, you know, so get, get, get these books. I will because I really have been asking people that for book recommendations and you just recommended me authors in addition to books and, you know, certain books and specific yeah. books. And so I really do. I personally will check them out and I encourage everybody to check them out. And especially if you only, um, only if you want to advance in this spiritual manner, you know, if you're content with yourself or or you think, you know, whatever, whatever you are. But the last thing I want to do is, is, in fact, Goldsmith, one thing he tells you to do is he says, don't go trying to start some new religion. Don't <laughs> try to write a book. I've written a book. Don't do any more than turn people on to my books. He says, because I've done the heavy lifting. No, it's your job to uh, to pick the fruit. You know, you don't have to grow the tree. You don't have to tend the tree. All you have to do is live off the fruit that it, that it, it it gives you. And if you can do that, then you're way ahead of the game, because that's that's really what we're doing. Our life is like the game of golf. If you've ever played golf, the idea. Think about golf. The idea is to put your ball into a hole. That's all. And the least strokes that you do to get that ball in the hole makes you a winner. And that's life. That is life. Our job is to get others like us. And if we can't do that, then help others do our job for them, for, for us, you know. There's always something that we can do to help, you know. And, and that's, that's the message that, that I, 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 I want to leave with everybody is that the secret of life is found through helping others. When you help others, you're getting close to the real secret of life. You have no idea who you're helping. How many people have helped me and had no idea what they were unleashing onto the world? 
<laughs> but I mean, your messages have always been peaceful. You've never been hateful or spiteful. It's just, it's been out of love. It's been out of observe. It's just, I just, I don't know. I think you're a unique breed and the, your, your, your generosity with, 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 with being so encouraging and like, honestly, like I, I, I feel so empowered and I, I really do. I, I, I've, I've always respected you and I've always loved you as, as a, as a comedian. And now I really have, I fuck, man. I fucking love you, dude. You do. Thank you. So thank you so much, man. Thank you for, for, for making my podcast better. And thank you for making my life better. And um, let's do it again. Anytime you, you name it, whenever you need it, uh, dude, come I'm back a- next week. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, you, you dude, it. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs> okay. Take care, bro. I love you, brother. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also do your boy a favor. Tell your friends, tell your cool family members, tell your cool co-workers, let them know about the podcast and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and be sure to follow me on all social media, Puro Papi Pacheco, and check out my website at HispanicTitanic.com for future dates. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day.